featuring Bolu Welcome Babalola. to our book chat featuring Bolu Babalola, the author of Honey and Spice, and our host, Amin Bawa Allah. Please give them a special Ake welcome. Congratulations again Thank on you. another smash hit because mm. that's what it is. I recommend this novel to anyone who has a pulse. <laughs> and I noticed that this this is the only romance novel on the West Star for Ake Festival. So <laughs> I'm dedicating wow. this this card to all the romance girlies. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, romance girl is a gender neutral term. Okay? All right. Great. Um you mentioned that Honey and Spice was a passion project that you started working on mm -hmm. before Love in Color. So my question is, how was the experience writing it? Because you were working full time. Yeah. And what did you do differently to prepare before birthing for Honey and Spice? Because you already had the experience of Love in Color. Well, yeah, in the beginning of writing Honey and Spice, so I started writing Honey and Spice when I was around 26 or something, which was like oh, about five years ago. And I was working full time then. And then I became a full time writer in the process. So I think that I was already in the groove of kind of discipline, which really helped in the process of writing Honey and Spice. But because I had a break with Love and Color, I went back to Honey and Spice. I found that I really grew in my craft, especially with Love and Color being a short story collection, which is its own craft in itself. I feel like my writing really matured, not just writing, but also the interrogation of love and romance. I felt like I was able to deepen the relationship in Honey and Spice so much more through writing Love and Color. So it was almost a blessing that Love and Color came and interrupted my flow of writing Honey and Spice. I don't think this story would have been that without Love and Color. I, I know you're, you're also a shy person, but marketing-wise, how... Do you feel like you had grown from Love and Color to marketing Honey and Spice? Yeah, well, yeah, I didn't really like talking <laughs> in, in theory. But the thing is, when I was in front of the camera talking about Love and Color and Honey and Spice, I was, in, I was in a very safe space because it's my passion. So I think that I, got I did get used to like being able to sum up. Don't ask me to do it, though. <laughs> sum up very quickly <laughs> the, the, the synopsis of the story. But also, it was just great to... I kind of fell in love with the story as I was talking about it more. So I actually began to look forward to the marketing with Honey and Spice. So I realized a new way for me mm. to look at my book. Even the questions that were being lobbied to me about my book, it forced me to ask questions about myself as a writer, which is really important for growth. So I actually mm. quite ended up quite enjoying it. Okay, okay. Um, so in the drafting process, I know it can be a bit challenging to drill down a character's core but Kiki and Malachi, those are the main characters in the book, by the way. Kiki and Malachi, their, their character development is so well fleshed out. I almost thought we're, at, we're dealing with like live people. So was there a scene or two in particular that was key in unlocking their characters to you? The intimate scene. Ah. <laughs> I actually wrote that before I wrote a lot of the rest of the book. I think it's the one thing that kind of stayed fairly the same through, through every single draft. Because for me, that was the core of who they were, how they interacted with each other, the safety that Kiki feels, and how gentle Malachi is. I feel like that was a manifestation of their dynamic. So I think that was really what I nailed at the beginning, pun not intended, <laughs> and then helped, <laughs> helped me <laughs> um, in fleshing out the characters around that. Oh, wow. Um, so... This book has one of my favorite tropes. For the romance girlies, is there anybody who likes a good fake dating scenario? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, 
so what is the secret to nailing down a trope and mm -hmm. how do you avoid it becoming cliche? Also, what tropes do you navigate? No, do you gravitate to when you're reading? It's a very good question. So with fake dating, we have to understand that fake dating is inherently ridiculous because you're not going to date somebody who you're fake date someone who you're not a little bit attracted to. And that's so much fun to explore because now we know these people are attracted to each other. And now we get to go on the journey of them realizing that attraction to each other and embracing that attraction to each other. And it gives us so much fun to play with the dynamics of vulnerability and intimacy and letting people in and, not re and pretending that you're not really letting them in and growth. So I love that. One thing that I think is going to be present in everything that I write is um, friends to lovers. So even, this is though, even though fake dating is kind of the overarching theme, there's, you know, there's fr uh, friends to lovers. You there's have a mini enemies to lovers. And minis, mini enemies to lovers that love to like two chapters. Because <laughs> the thing with enemies to lovers that I find difficult is that like, well, me personally, I can't imagine growing from hate to love. Like if I Same. if I hate you, I'm I'm hating you. So like, like it's not it's not a thing where like I'm gonna grow to like you. <laughs> so I was like, let them be enemies to lovers, but it's fake. It's kind of fake enemies to lovers because Loki is a little bit of attraction there. But friends to lovers, I love, because I feel like friendship, I think we've discussed this before, friendship is, for me, the basis of romance. So even with all the themes there are and all the tropes there are, there's, there's always going to be a core of friendship in every romance that I write. Okay. Um, I think it's time for a little reading. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Which one should I read? I don't even know if I really was doing anything, so I like... Um, when they, when they first meet, when the two characters first meet. First meet. Okay. Yes. We love a meet cute. <laughs> okay. Let me find it. Mm -hmm. Let me find it. Let me find it. How long does it have to be? Um, just until we see the spark. <laughs> I hit a very firm, warm wall, my nose squishing against the so soft cotton of a slate gray shirt. Shit, my bad. Nah, it's cool, don't. The voice was low and smooth, thick like honey suck sunk to the bottom of a tumbler of cognac. I looked up, but not enough, because I found I'd only reached his nose. It traveled down his face narrowly and then curved out drastically, majestically. I mean, it was quite enough to look at, but I but thought, I thought I'd try again. I tilted my head a little further up till I hit a black, hit black quartz gazing at me, glinting. He was looking at me like he knew me. That was weird for a number of reasons, reasons, including but not limited to the fact that I knew everybody in the Black Caucus of Whitewell College. I knew every clique, subgroup, and faction. And granted, it was the third week of second year, so there was a bunch of new people, but even so, I flicked through my mental Rolodex of Mandem and came up blank. He wasn't part of the Nigerian princes, sons of the Nigerian politicians. The Fairy Road men studying pharmacy at a red brick university is not the same as dealing, sweetie. The future shiny suits who read, a group that could include any of the above, but usually studied something finance related, sought to work in the city, wanted an educated girl who knew her place, quite fine, and included my guy, nor the water into wine at the club Bible study boys. Nothing. Looking at his face seemed to actively contribute to my mind blankness, which was bizarre because my mind was never blank unless made purposely so. Like when my guy was trying to talk to me about the 48 of laws of power one time. He blinked and cleared his throat, even though when I heard his voice the first time, it didn't sound like it could get any clearer. Uh, don't sweat it. Funny he should mention that because I was. My skin was tingling. This was intriguing. I didn't really sweat, and when I did, at the time I went on the elliptical for two hours while watching Beachella on my phone, it was like this, a swipe prickle. I don't sweat, but thanks. I started to move past him to the, to the lift, encouraging him to do the same, towards his destination, his destiny, away from me. When he stopped, suddenly it turned around, dark brows furrowed. I'm sorry, I just, did you say you don't sweat? I cast a gaze across the hall, 
partly to obnoxiously demonstrate the fact that no one else could have said what I just said, and also to double check that nobody was coming out or coming in. I, know, I knew every black Wellian who lived on my guy's floor. I timed my visit, knowing the two of them were at Bible study, one at football, another at a friend's birthday dinner. There was nobody. I wouldn't be seen. I looked back at him, hitched the shoulder upwards. Yeah, why? He nodded, eyes squinting, concentrating the light, the corner of his plush mouth quirking up. Well, sweating is a regular biological human function. What's your point? So you're saying you're not a regular human? I smiled, slid my head to the side. Do I look like a regular human to you? Trick question. He would stumble or leave, stumble and leave. It was fun tangling my words around their ankles without them realizing and then watching them trip. He inhaled deeply like he was considering the question. He stepped back a little and assessed me, flicked a gaze, a quick gaze down me that felt like he was striking a match against my body. Something fled under my skin. His eyes rose to meet mine again. Nah, definitely not regular. My pulse stuttered. Um, so why did you set this novel in, because for those who haven't read Love in Color, it's, it's, um, a reimagining of mythical stories. And when I heard you were writing a new book, I was like, okay, we're going to get like adult romance. Mm -hmm. Why did you set those on in a university, in a university space? Oh, multiple reasons. I think that first of all, it was wish fulfillment for university me who did not date. <laughs> I was like, this is the, what I wanted to happen when I was in university. Um, and what I wanted to read as well when I was that age. I was looking for a black girl that was like me, uh, who knew herself but had her insecurities and found somebody who can match her. But also I find universities so fascinating and the campus backdrop so fascinating because you're technically adults, but you're also children and you're away from your family. And so you're, you, you now have to find your own chosen family and your own community. And it's almost like a new adolescence in, in growth. And also, it's just an interesting incubator of emotions. Everything is so heightened. Everything feels life or death. And I felt like that was such an interesting capsule to explore very much within in a really fun way where I can really just be as dramatic as I want, you know? And, but also, it, it really kind of, it's such a like strong lens into romance itself in the wider world. And it just seems like a great manifestation of, of that. Um, as you were reading, I, I, I didn't even have this question on my list, but how did you choose this voice? <coughs> because a preference of mine is when I'm reading in romance novel, I like to get the POV of the mm. man and the woman. And this is just Kiki's POV. And it's giving, you know, spoken word mm. vibe. How did you choose? Was that the original style? Um, as in just Kiki's voice? Yes. Yes. I think I think that even when I was selling Honey and Spice, I've met a few publishers who were like, would you introduce, you know, that's a normal romance trope, you know, do, do your POV. Would you want to introduce Malachi's voice? And I was like, no, because that defeats the purpose of this. Oh, um, Kiki embracing herself and on her own hero's journey. And Malachi is wonderful and great, but he's an addition to her journey. This is not, he, and he is part of it, but he's just, it's not about him in that sense. Um, in the sequel, um, yes, we, we might see Malachi's voice, but for this, this is just, this is about Kiki and her journey. Okay, that was an exclusive for getting a yeah. sequel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so you did say Mal the book is not about Malachi, but um, Malachi shines through. I mean, he's a hard guy, but he's still very soft mm -hmm. inside. How How do you write a character from the opposite sex? Like, how do you get in that headspace and not make him seem like he's simping? Not like there's a problem with simping because you should simp for those you love, but mm. like, yeah. I always had anxiety about that, actually. Writing a realistic um, male protagonist that was, yes, somebody who you'd want to fall in love with, but not somebody that was totally fantastical. And I think all the good things about Malachi are not like, I'm not crazy. These are the things about Malachi that women have told me, and young women have told me that they like about him. He listens. <laughs> he supports her hobbies. Um, he genuinely likes her as a person. He stands up for her. 
And I think that the only things that are kind of heightened is, just, you know, maybe he dresses up as a favorite character in her book. Even though I don't think that's, that's heightened, I feel like what that symbolizes is somebody who cares enough about you to show up. And so I think it's just balancing really grounded qualities with, of course, romantic situations to build this, you know, real person. And also he's flawed, you know, he's a player and everything. But I think that it's really easy to have a two-dimensional character who's like a hard guy, and he's just like a bit brutal, and but he's only tender towards her. I wanted to build a guy who was just tender all around, but he also happened to be a player and he also had some trauma that he had to work through and relationship issues, not necessarily romantic, that he had to work through and um, be on his own journey, almost to be worthy of um, Kiki. So it's just about, you know, what do people go through and what, what makes us the sum of who we are? Because um, it's the same for men and women, you know? And I think sometimes in romance, we tend to make the men dimensional and I wanted him to be real and also somebody that we can go away from go away from the book and be like I think I can meet somebody like this in real life he's not too far away from reality for it to be a fantasy you you actually nailed that and Kiki and Malachi have undeniable chemistry so you said you started the book from uh the intimacy mm -hmm. bit what do you think is crucial in writing that kind of chemistry and at the end, good smut. I don't know how to describe smut to the <laughs> uninitiated. Spice. It's spice. 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 You know. <laughs> um, definitely character work. Because for me, a good intimate scene is um, when it's a manifestation of the character's dynamic and how they relate to each other. And also their vulnerabilities. So if they're insecure about this thing, that kind of thing is soothed or addressed within the intimate scene. Um, of course, it's really fun, but it's fun according to who they are. So Kiki, um, no spoilers, but she, you know, she has a little bit of physical kind of restraint for some reason. And that's addressed in the intimate scene. I don't want to do, it's never one size fits all. It has to be in accordance to who they are as people. And also their conversations. Um, they do have good banter. They have, you know, they are. And I really enjoy writing conversations because for me, romance, romance is conversations. It's about how you relate to each other. It's about the humor. It's about somebody seeing you and embracing you. And so I actually write so many conversations between Kiki and Malika that some that didn't end up in the book. Just like dumb things like when was your first kiss and how they would joke about that. And that, whether it's in the book or not, Will relate to how they are physically with each other in the book somehow. Oh, nice. Okay, um, so I have a question from a big fan of yours. Her name is Kikiola. Hi, Kiki. She's watching Aww. online now. Um, wow. The question is is out. Yeah. <laughs> I love your passion for writing empowering stories with women fully in charge of their destinies, featuring male leads who respect and cherish them as they do so. Why do you think it's important to write romances like that? What do you hope readers will take away from meeting your characters? Oh, wow. Um, so I'll start with a little story. I went, I did a school talk um, with 15, 14 year olds and they'd read Honey and Spice and Loving Color. And this is one of the best things that anyone has ever said to me at my work. She said, young girl, she said, um, I love your writing so much and it really means, makes me believe in love and finding somebody who will respect me and, you know, cherish me, which is why I've chosen not to date right now. <laughs> because nobody around, nobody in this stupid school <laughs> is worth all that. And I'm like, yes, exactly. It's not about romance for the sake of romance and because society says you should be dating when you're 15 or whatever, whatever age. It's about finding somebody of romance that suits you and... Um, really kind of adds to your life and it does not form the substance of your life. I think in everything I write, the woman has to go on her own journey of her own growth and um, strength and loving herself. And also the friendships that help build her, the female friendships that help build her as well. Amina and Kiki are a central love story in Honey and Spice as well. Um, and also Kiki only kind of steps out for romantic affection when she realizes that, oh, this guy's for real and he likes me for me. And it's not just about, you know, the physical of it. It's not just about conquering me or 
possession. It's about actually being in a relationship with who I am. So it's just that. It's just that having those standards for yourself and those standards of romance for yourself and knowing that romance, it's not romance for the sake of romance. It's romance because it suits you. Yes. Um, you're welcome, Kiki. <laughs> um, so you did talk about side um, friendships and your side characters are very dramatic in this <laughs> book. And in romance or mysteries, if you read a lot of that, they are always like a peek into a sequel or like the rest of the series. Are there other friendship groups or just girl crews you've read in book or film that inspired you? Mm, that's a really good question. I think it was really just more my experience with my female friendships because they were the romance in my life for so long and also even when I did meet somebody they were part of it and they would challenge me and they're like Bolu I think you're wrong here you know and I think that's so important to have a, a friend that challenges you and I didn't want Kiki cause sometimes the best friend's characters are there as cheerleaders to enable their friends and of course there's moments of that but they're also it's a sisterhood and they're also there to call you out so it's really based on my experience of um of friendship and also one of the one of the first rom-coms i actually read and people don't really think about it as a, of a as a rom-com was pride and prejudice when i was 12 and um the relationship between elizabeth was and jane is so beautiful and so sweet and they love each other so much and it's almost it is as strong as the relationship between um elizabeth and darcy so that's something that i think is part of the blueprint of everything that i write so from this conversation you've your answers it's seeming like how many percentage of bolu is in kiki oh gosh Okay, this is, a contra this is controversial because when I was writing it, I was like, none. And then my friends read it and they're like, Bolu, come. Um, <laughs> she has exactly the same issues as you. And I was like, oh. And when I was reading it, I was like, okay, yeah, I think I was working. This is my therapy. I was working, <laughs> I was working through some things through Kiki. So I think unconsciously there's a lot of me in Kiki, more than maybe any character that I've ever written. Yeah. And also because I started writing her when I was closer to her age. She was 20, 20 21, and I was like 25, 26. So, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so, you've mentioned in interviews that your parents' relationship is kind of the blueprint. Now, as an observer and writer of romance, no, as a rom connoisseur. No. <laughs> <laughs> What are your thoughts on what's happening in the streets? Because we have people in exclusive situationships out there. It's scary, guys. It's really scary. There's a lack of discipline. As, and there's an acceptance of bad behavior. Like, this is just how men are. And I feel like you should set your standards. And I think also, I think people, it's not by force to date. You know, if there's nobody around that's worthy of you, then you don't actually have to date. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think romancing yourself is very underrated, especially as a woman. I feel like it's really important to do that work of loving yourself, loving your the women around you as well, and building that community. And I feel like that really creates a great um, atmosphere to to find the love that's really for you. Um, I know it sounds so trite, but it's really not about not settling and not accepting rubbish, truly. Because men are going to do what they're going to do, but you also n can set what you're going to accept. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's really that. But the streets are, I mean, the streets are they're wild. They're, they're wild, yeah. Yeah. Did you say empty? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Things are happening out there. Okay. Um, so, the priority when writing a story should be the story. I mean, I, I don't like books being too agendary also mm -hmm. yes that's a word i just made up I love um it. but do you always think about ways that you can push back on gender stereotypes mm. Mm. not consciously i don't think because i think my my kind of only mission is to tell the truth and my the truth according to me and if my women happen to be you know, strong-minded and everything like that. That's because how, that's how I see women. That's the women that I grew up with. That's the women that I know. And 
if they're feminists because I'm a feminist, you know, it's it's not because I'm trying to push against stereotypes because I feel like when you're doing that, once you're doing that, then you are. If you're saying, okay, I want to write a black woman and she's a very sexual, but I don't want to seem too hypersexual because that's a stereotype. I feel like then you're giving that stereotype too much power and that stereotype is a lie. As long as you make the person feel real and fully fleshed out, then that's your only, that's your only mission. I feel like stereotypes are too D. And as long as you're right, your mission is to write a fully fleshed three-dimensional person, then that's it. Because I feel like then you're just giving them, it's giving it too, con too much control over your writing. Okay. okay. Um, I do have a lot of questions, but I don't want to hold the mic. Um, does anybody have any question to start? Wow. Okay. Because <laughs> you have, the fans are plenty. Um, can we have a mic? There's someone in front, two in front, and then... Can we start with her? Let, yeah, we'll come back to you, Noria. Hi. Hello. So, um, surprisingly, I saw you downstairs and I've been seeing you throughout, and I didn't know it was you, so <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad to meet you. Anyway, um, as a Nigerian writer who is in the querying trenches, I just want you to like tell me about your story, mm -hmm. uh, how it was querying, and obviously, we all love Kiki and Malakai, and um, Okay, I've forgotten everything I wanted to say. It's okay. <laughs> but it's anyway, okay. so the querying, the querying story. Um, oh, I stalked my agent for a long time. That's the beginning of the story. I entered a short story competition. Um, my short story Netflix and, Chill got sh Netflix and Chill got shortlisted, and I used that to get my agent. And then it was just a case of, because I had that short story out, that w it was kind of easier to query. Um, and then I think, and then, oh yeah. And then I was trying to think of what happened. Loving Color came about because an editor knew I was, um, I was a culture journalist as well. And I wrote a lot about romance and love and I was published in some um, magazines. And she read Netflix and chill and she said, oh, I think you are a writer of short stories. Now, I didn't consider myself a writer of short stories actually, because, and as much as I love the form, I think it's actually really, really hard to write short stories. After I write Love and Color, I was like, I'm never doing that again. I think I might still, but I loved it. I think actually that made me a better long form writer writing short stories. But anyway, she um, read Netflix and Chill and she said, I think you can write more. And I was like, that was really, Netflix and Chill was really hard to write. I don't know if I can do that again, because with short stories, you have to write a whole world in such a short amount of space. Um, but she convinced me and I began to think about it and then I and I started writing a short story competition, comp short story collection. So she actually approached me, but that was because I had put my writing out there. I put published Netflix and Chill on Medium and because it got shortlisted, but they didn't publish it. So I was like, let me just put my own writing out there. And I put my own writing out there independently. And then I started getting attention from publications and it kind of made things easier for me. And with Loving Color being out, that made Honey and Spice easier for me. But um, it was about pushing myself out there and stalking my agent on Twitter before she, so she had no choice but to sign me. <laughs> okay. liking, every single st liking every single tweet. <laughs> <laughs> I do get the vibes. I'm very good at stalking as mm. a fan girl. Um, can we give? Oh, sorry, sorry. Welcome in. Welcome in. Hi. Okay. Hi, Bolin. Hello. Um, I also stalk you on Twitter. <laughs> so just putting that out there. Um, I have two questions. One, as a Sorry, um, I said I, what I said was that I, I also stalk <laughs> you on social media, especially on Twitter. So just putting it out there, I have two questions. First, what would you say as a rom-com seer, what would you say is the greatest love story ever told? Oh, wow. Two, yeah. <laughs> I know and it's your own personal opinion, so I'm certain you can be like, oh, it's something else, I don't know. Um, second question, if you had the chance to, um, I wouldn't say rewrite, but just like put your own twist on like an iconic love story. What would it be? It could be Pride and Prejudice. It could be Wuthering Heights. For those that think that that's a love story, what would it be? Not the shade. <laughs> 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 um, 
Um, so the first part of the question was, oh, the greatest love story ever told? Oh, that's tough. I think that's, mm, that's all relative, you know. What's your opinion, though? So. I think, actually, actually, I know it sounds really trite and really religious, and whether you believe it or not, I feel like, like Jesus dying for your, like, actually say, even if it's like a fairy tale to you, I feel like God giving his child and then the child dying for the sins of humanity is very, I mean, that's a love story. And people wouldn't think of it as a love story, but it is a love story. My, what I would say for me is, I think my parents actually, because that's what, that's what taught me love and that's what inspired my conception <laughs> of love. Um, and I think that also what I took from their relationship or take from their relationship is, is the friendship. Like, I think one of my lasting memories from my childhood is just hearing my parents laugh. Like, whatever room I was in the house, I could just hear them giggle together, which used to be really annoying, but now I'm like, whoa, wow, what a blessing <laughs> that is. So definitely that. And in terms of um, my writing, what would I, like, uh, rewrite? I actually got asked to do this, turn it up for different reasons, but, like, what I would love to do if I had the opportunity to do is uh, adapt Pride and Prejudice, but set it like completely like Nigerian. Um, and, and whether that might be a period drama, so it could be like, you know, in the past or now, I think it's so easy to pick up Pride and Prejudice and plop it in a Nigerian society in which, whichever era actually. So I think I would love to do that. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> I would love to do it, I wanna do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll do one from here and then we go back here. Okay. Hi, Bolu. Hi, um, first of all, thank you so much for writing the most beautiful romantic story that's very African. Because I read a lot of romance novels and most times they are from like white people and most of the references are Taylor Swift. But then I was reading Honey and Spice and there were so many Beyonce references. I was like, girl, you get me. Because <laughs> I think Taylor Swift is great, but um, Beyonce is the goat. If you don't agree, you lack taste. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think it's really beautiful that um, you wrote an African romance story because I think it's important that um, Africans fall in love and we experience joy. Trauma is not all we have, so I think that's important. And when I was reading Honey and Spice, um, one thing that stuck out to me was the pop culture references. And it's different from other books that I've read. It's like pop culture meets literature. It was such a beautiful blend. And I was, I was wondering if that was something deliberate, because I know you're a pop culture scholar, because mm -hmm. I stalk you a lot, but mm -hmm. not like in a Joe Goldberg creepy way. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I was wondering if that was a deliberating or it was just unconscious because you love um, pop culture. Um, my second question is, um, somebody read the book and was telling me that um, the book was trying to be Nigerian too much mm. because there's this thing where with, um, there's a running joke in Nigeria that um, writers in diaspora always try to be mm. so Nigerian. But when I read the book, it wasn't trying to be fully Nigerian. It wasn't trying to be fully British. To me, it was Nigerian British. Mm. I feel like it was two identities blend together. So I'm wondering, when you were writing the book, did you have an identity crisis? Like, um, <laughs> did you like um, try to overcompensate for being a Nigerian yeah. in diaspora, or did you try to be way more British or way more Nigerian, or how did that happen? Basically, um, thank you. No, I was just writing how I am, <laughs> frankly. It's so funny that they said that because I am Nigerian. So anything that in the book, it wasn't like, let me try and make this book more Nigerian. It, it was for me, it's from my experience, it's from my knowledge, it's from my life. Um, same with the pop culture, actually. Um, because, especially because um, I, was a, I was a journalist that wrote about pop culture a lot. So it, that kind of seeps into my writing anyway. So yeah, it was just about me and my mind and how I think and how I am. Um, and I think I'm always trying not to try to do anything in my book, but tell my truth and my story according to me and my worldview. So yeah, it was very natural because I was just writing how I think. Hi. No, I can't talk but over the moderator. Can I ask? Okay. 
Okay, yeah. uh, okay. Hi, I love your book. Um, I felt like the story between Malachi and, of course, Kiki was just really beautiful. Actually, Malachi kind of reminds me of my man. So yes! <laughs> and I think that's why I really love the book. Energy! <laughs> Okay, so apart from the love story, I know we look at this story like a rom-com, it's really sweet, but I think there's also the part of Malachi's father mm. and how he treats him. Um, being black in the UK mm. and the black excellence that's expected of mm. you in university, um, how black students relate with each other in the ACS community, and um, basically just how um racism also plays a part so my question really to you is like i know she kind of almost asked what i was trying to ask but what was the what was the um thought process behind you presenting that nigerian in the uk or the nigerian british experience you know in that book because i it reminded me so much of my uni days. It was just exactly the same, and I was cackling all through when I was reading it. So what was the intention, uh, or was there any intention behind presenting that experience? Um, it's just a specific experience. I experienced it as well. Um, I was part of the ACS <laughs> in the university, and it was, wow, it was so, there was so much drama. There was corruption, <laughs> there was sabotage. It was, there was a lot of drama. And I was like, this is such an interesting, world I feel like I haven't really seen in any media and I just wanted to I wanted to write something for us basically something that we can relate to um in terms of Malachi I thought there was just so many men who struggle with that relationship with their father and the expectations and then also feeling as kind of depression and not being able to express it because they feel weak and all of that stuff and I wanted to give space for Malachi to be that to be our romantic hero but also have the space for him to go through his own mental health stuff and go through his own journey of being able to talk and finding somebody in Kiki in the, in the, and that he can like open up to. Um, because as much as Kiki learns to open up, Malachi also learns to open up, which goes back to your, how did I make Malachi real? It was like, what do we go through as human beings? Everything that we go through, men can go through as well. So that's kind of how I humanized him. But yeah, it was about, it was based on my experience and experience of many people I know and wanted to kind of talk about that because I feel like I had so many stories that I, there's so much more stories I could like wrench in there but you know I only had certain pages and even then it was so long so yeah um can we give the mic to a hand has been up since hi Bolo hi everyone okay so I love your book but I think what struck most about your book was the dedication um piece towards the end, and the story of your parents and how you describe them, Uluwa Kemi, Uluwa Femi, and mm. how it means the same thing but in different ways. And you just talked about how um, the greatest love story that you know is that of your parents. So I was wondering, do you intend to write a, a book about their story? Well, I did write a story. I did. I did. I wrote, I wrote a story based, based yeah, Alago Meji, which is where they lived um, in Love and Color. But I think that's it. I think <laughs> because I think they're also very private people. And then also it might just be too, I don't know. I could do it, but there's a lot of kind of protections I would have to put for themselves and for myself to, in order to write it. Um, but I did that in Loving Color. And I put it in Loving Color because it's one of the stories, again, that influenced me. So that was kind of my homage to them. Just please grab it, copy outside. <laughs> Thanks. All right, okay. Um, can we get the mic here? The mic is far. Right here. Hi, Bolu. Hello. Hi, Amin. Um, I have Hi. two questions for you. So my first question is, well, first a comment and a question. My comment is, um, growing up, we didn't see a lot of black Nigerian women writing romance novels. Um, when you think about Nigerian writers, even Nigerian writers in the diaspora, you think about writers writing literary fiction, you think about writers writing what they call serious books. So um, I know it's been romance for you for a long time, like mm -hmm. you love love. Um, how do you deal with feelings, if you deal with any, um, from people that think 
you're not writing, you're not doing serious work, mm. um, or how do you not justify, but like that's the word that comes to mm. mind now to yourself that the work that you do is important work mm. and that is serious work. That's my first question. Um, my second question is, what are you currently reading? Okay. Um, I don't think about them, honestly. I don't think about them at all because for me, what I do is serious work. Um, it's really important to me. <laughs> and it's important to a lot of people. So, and I think that once you start to think about that, then it, it's going to affect your work. It's going to bleed into your work. And my priority is to tell a story that's important to me. Um, was, does that answer? Was there more? The second part. What am I reading? Okay, so right now I'm reading Yellow Face, um, which I'm really interested, I'm really, really <laughs> getting into. A very wild book. What was the last book? Actually, the last book I read after, um, before this was, um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's Tia Williams' third book that I think is out next year because I really loved um, Seven Days in June. So, and I feel like you guys will really, really love this, this last book. So, get it. Wow. Okay. Um, and oh, okay. Yeah. Hi, Bolu. Hello. I'm such a huge fan. I love how you exude so much grace and, you know, feels like you're enjoying life. I project <laughs> that on we, your fans. So when I read um, Onion and Spice, I was looking to read something light-hearted. I mean, away from the regular mm -hmm. Nigerian trauma books. And it was even Amin that I recommended it. On her. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry for the shade. So Amin <laughs> recommended <laughs> So I mean, recommended it on our Twitter page, and she was like, "The girls that get it get it." I was like, "Okay, I get it. <laughs> I need to get this book." So yeah, so I don't really have a question. It's more like um, something I observed. Uh, Malachi's dad, from mm. that perspective, um, it was obvious that he did not want Malachi to, you know, the regular Nigerian mm. parents continue to study professional courses mm. in the university and like, you know, for them to brag at home that my son is a lawyer, a doctor. But um, Malachi wanted to pursue. Mm his hobby, what he loves doing. And I think that's very common in the present. I mean, it has been common for a while now, but it's still there. And I want to know how, I know you studied law, and now you're a writer. I want to know how you would want your readers, the younger generations, um, to maneuver things like that, you know, situations like that, as they grow up and, you know, through your book, so. Oh, that's a big question. I think I want to, I think there's a reason why I made them both kind of creators because I feel like that kind of, it's a craft and it really is a discipline and I feel like it's, it's treated as just like a hobby when they, it's their passion. So I wanted to encourage, I think implicitly I was trying to encourage them to pursue it. And it wasn't that, you know, Malachi has his, like his business model, he was trying to balance it a bit, um, but it was just about encouraging them to just kind of go for it and still you know malachi still respects his dad and still trying to be respectful but he's like respectfully <laughs> i still want to do what i want to do and at the end of the day you're going to be and i'm not telling people to be like you know be rude to their parents but at the end of the day you are the one who's living your life <laughs> you know not them and you and you know malachi did what his dad wanted to do and he got depressed you know so then at, at one point as an adult he had to put him himself first you know so it was just that it was just kind of pursuing your passions and, and not letting them die. Um, okay, there's, there's a, ha okay, ooh. Are we giving out the mic? Hi, Bolu. Hello. Hi, Bolu. Oh. Hello, everyone. Oh. Two mics, wow. <laughs> okay, hello, okay. everyone. Okay, let her ask us first, okay. Oh, I don't actually have a question. It's um, just a comment. I belong to that crop of people who read more literary fiction than other genres. Of course, I do read a lot of smut. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm redeemed by that. Mm -hmm. So seeing you today, hearing you talk about your book has made me think, um, maybe you should go back to romance. Because the thing is, I stopped reading romance at age 12. Jesus when I did Christ. You were not down. even supposed to be reading it <laughs> <laughs> at that time. <laughs> I stopped at age 12 because I discovered literary fiction. Mm. Yeah, I stopped. I started at seven. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> I stopped reading romance at age 12 because I discovered literary fiction. Because the romance I was reading was predominantly in white. So yeah. somebody suggested Bolu. And I'm like, okay, someone in the diaspora. I'm not sure I can relate. But then hearing you talk about your book so passionately, I'm going to check it out. Okay, thank, thank you. you.
Yay. Please buy the two books. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, good morning, Volu. Good morning. So uh, my question is very simple. So it's one thing to write a romance novel. It's another to write a love story. And I think that with your book, you wrote a love story. How were you Thank able you. to develop that kind of chemistry that jumped out of every page? It was you know, palpable, was strong. How were you able to build that kind of you know, chemistry? Oh, um, again, it was character work, I think, knowing who Kiki was. And she's, you know, she was a complicated person. She has layers. So the person who would match her will also have to have layers and be patient. And so it's understanding who they are as people. And also, personally, it was like, what would I want in a relationship? It was manifestation, because I did find that. But it was like, what would I want? What would I want to have? And it's just like that friendship. And I think knowing that, knowing the characters made that, I feel like it, what people see as real is what made that real, I think, because I did a lot, a lot of character work. Sometimes, again, like I said, I would write scenes between them that wouldn't end up in the book. And I think that makes them real. Sometimes, like a mad person, I would say the conversations out loud, being both characters in an empty room, just saying it. Just, I wanted to see how it would sound in real life, you know? And if there's a conversation that you can overhear in a cafe and blush to, you know? So it, it was all of that. It was character building, I think. Um, before we, is it okay? All right. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hey. Hi, buddy. Um, I'm a huge fan. Um, and especially of Loving Color, I'm obsessed with that book. So I wanted to ask you, um, of all the stories, which one a would you have? Would you love to see made into a movie or something like a TV show of Loving Color? And which one do you think, if you could ever like? I feel like write it as a full novel of all of those stories in that book. Because I love, don't get me wrong, love the short stories. I love the little bursts, but like, do you know when you read something, I feel like it's the first short story for me. I'm like, girl, if you could just write, if you could just keep going, like I would be like ready for you to, I just am always curious with short story writers because it is a craft. If you ever write one and you're thinking, oh God, I wish I, I like, if, oh, if that makes sense. Yeah, so the first question was about TV. I don't think I can answer that question, okay? <laughs> um, not I'm not legally allowed to talk about, talk about that. But the second one was, um, which would I make into a full novel? Hmm. I think Nefertiti is one because it's just so, I really enjoyed writing that world. It was like, I was there. I just wanted to be in that club. It was really dystopian. I did so ridiculous amount of research for it. Like I was like, what do we Egyptians wear and, wear and all of this stuff? And I feel like I have a surplus of Egypt <laughs> Egyptology <laughs> in my head um, to write that. So I think I would love to write that into a novel if I had the opportunity to do so. But if not, I would write something similar to that. Um, of course, I love Oshun's. But that was the first story I actually wrote for the story. And that, that one has a special place in my heart. Hi, Bolu. Hello, man. So I, um, I, somebody asked on Twitter if they could ask you a question, and I said yes. So I have a question here from Emmanuel Faith. And he says, on the first page, Bolu made reference to how ovulation makes <laughs> ladies do what they don't want to do. Uh. <laughs> yes. um, hmm. Can you say something about the importance of literature talking about issues like this? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think women just want to read something that they relate to. Everybody knows, you know, sometimes when you're ovulating, just your body, you know, acts in a certain way. <laughs> That might lead to decisions that you wouldn't make when you're maybe of total sound mind. I think anyone that, I just want to write uh, people that people can relate to and situations that we can all relate to. And I think that's what the beauty of literature is finding yourself in a story, you know, a different world. Um, so yeah, I just want to write a relatable, relatable situations. Um, before anybody else wants to ask a question, are there other authors within the romance or outside the genre that have inspired you? I think it's like, 
I mean, there's the greats, of course, like the Tony Morrison's and, you know, every, like all of them, Maya Angelou, all of them inspire me. But right now, I really love being inspired by my peers. So I love Tia Williams. I was so excited when I got to do an event with Tia Williams and she said it first. She was like, I feel like we're sister authors. I was like, thank God you said it because I'm obsessed with you. And I really find an affinity with her writing, but also I'm inspired by her writing and how, and it really inspires me to be better as well. So yeah, I think it's more like peer to peer. Yeah, encouragement. Can you remember what books you were reading at the time? Of writing Honey and Spice? I actually tried not to read because I was really ah. scared of, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I find out I pl accidentally plagiarized my worst nightmare. So I didn't. But like growing up, I've, everything that I read kind of inspired me. I read a lot of Meg Cabot. I read a lot of, um, um, I don't know if anyone's heard of Louise Renison, but she's like the British Meg Cabot. And um, Jane Austen. Tony Morrison, like all of all of these things, kind of inspired me, and also movies. I love Ten Things I Hate About You wow. and all of those, you know, seminal teen movies. Um, has the question, is it going to sell, ever crossed your mind when you're working, when you're writing? Oh no, because then you'll just be paralyzed. Like you just, when those things start to creep in your head, it really does start to affect the writing, and then the anxiety. Writing quite anxiety inducing anyway it's quite scary anything to pull yourself onto a page and when those things start to creep in that's when it starts to affect the writing it's the reason why i don't go on goodreads either because when you start to read all these opinions you start to kind of shift how you're writing in accordance to what people think and then that compromises the integrity of your writing so i try to avoid all of that any okay there's microphone to Hi again. Hello. Um, I wanted to. I, I've always wanted to ask this to a romance writer. Um, do you ever wonder um, what your family thinks mm. when they read like the intimate? That's scenes? a great question. <laughs> um, so I told them explicitly not to read Honey and Spice, and that's not even. It's not even like that spicy. But I just knew that no. That's why actually I wrote Love in Color. I feel like I'm so happy I wrote Love in Color because I feel like this is that's the auntie book. I was like I think that's <laughs> quite safe for anyone older in my family to read. I always say, Daddy, if you want to give the book to anyone, just give Love in Color. Don't give Honey and Spice. And also, I feel like Honey and Spice is probably going to be the tamer book out of everything that I put out after that. I think it's just going to be a <laughs> more and more spicy. So <laughs> I heard, yeah, no, I explicitly tell them not to read. Yeah. yeah. Encourage from afar. Um, there's <coughs> someone here. So I finally remembered the question, and it's <laughs> about my guy. Mm. I feel like um, when I read that part of mm. my guy and finally finding who the guy my is. guy yeah. was, I wasn't as much shocked as I was like, yeah, I can, I can see this. So I went to ask, who was your guy? Oh, who was my guy in terms of like, in I think my guy is a representation of like bad decisions that we make <laughs> when we're, when we're not, um, when we haven't like healed from things and when we don't want to address things and when we're kind of running away things, it's kind of a figurative representation of that because it's not somebody that she's particularly like, she like even likes as a person. Yeah. It's more like an escape. So it's more representation of that. It was a very good representation. <laughs> Okay, anybody else? Are we good? Okay, all right. Um, so what's next for Boliva Balola? Because your fans are waiting for... And in fact, you could write copy at this <laughs> point. <laughs> um, so I'm working on a few TV projects right now. And also, <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm writing the third, my third book to honey and spice um and that's eight years in the future so oh. malachi every the whole gang the adults they're pushing 30 life is lifing <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna see what happens to romance when life is lifing yeah. you know and what happens when you meet who you think is the love of your life 
university and how does growth mm. affect that and how does maturity affect that and all of that stuff so yeah, yeah. <laughs> No pressure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, wow. Oh, okay. Oh, date. Well, beginning Ooh. of 2020. Well, don't she scream at me. It was meant to be end of next year, but now it's beginning of 2025. Yes. yes. Mm, okay. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Oh. We have one mm. more reason to stay alive to 2025. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I just quickly wanted to ask before we round up. How do you think social media and instant messaging has changed um, <coughs> the course of courtship? Because mm. I feel like if I say courtship, it, it just sounds like, you know, don't we're get getting me started. Some, yeah. Yeah. I feel like it really kills romance. What is a fire emoji? <laughs> is that it always like, I just get angry. I feel like men don't know how to court these days. And when a man does engage with you as a human being in real life, it's like, oh my God, wow. <laughs> wow. Like, I think that it really does mean it's just low stakes, low effort, and low investment. And I feel like that is what kills very much because then you're not treating people as people, you're treating them as conquest. Like, okay, yes, I've sent her an emoji, I've sent her an emoji, I've had, and you're not engaging with it. So I think it has affected romance, and it's to the detriment of romance. I mean, it can heighten it in a way sometimes when it's like, oh my gosh, he likes my picture. But also it's like, what is happening after he likes your picture? <laughs> is he talking to you after, he, like, is he, like, what is it? And I feel like it's, it's a way that people can show interest without showing interest. And I think that's what, I don't like that part of it. Okay. Um, I feel like we have concluded this session in like record time. Clap for me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bolu. Thank you so um, much. There will be a long queue outside. <laughs> and I recommend, if you haven't read any of our books, make sure you get both books. If you get one, you will feel like you're missing out. And I'm not just saying this. So thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Wonderful audience. Thank you.